This presentation is on the poets Oliver Goldsmith and George Crabbe. And we'll start with Oliver Goldsmith, who was born around 1730. Don't know for sure. He was born in rural Ireland, so like Swift, uh, born in Ireland. He was born in either County Longford or Roscommon to an Anglican clergyman. From 1747 to 55, he studies at Trinity College, Dublin, uh, just as Swift had done. And then from 1752, studies medicine at the University of Edinburgh, but fails to distinguish himself at either place. After a walking tour of Europe in uh, 1756, he settles in London and begins a desultory writing editing career, working with uh, some London magazinists. And in 1760, his, his first um, major work, the work that gets him some, some, some notoriety, is a popular series of articles uh, in the form of an epistolary travelogue using the persona of a Chinese traveler who comes to England and observes British culture and uh, society. And these articles were published as the citizen of the world. In 1764, this work that he was doing, his literary work, eventually brings him into contact with a man named Edmund Burke, uh, a very, very well-known politician and intellectual who was very close friends with um, the literary critic of the 18th century, Samuel Johnson, who, who, uh, who wrote the first, um, well, one of the first dictionaries of the English language. And both these men, Edmund Burke and Samuel Johnson, recognized uh, Goldsmith's talent and supported him. And together um, with some other prominent London intellectuals, they formed um, an influential social network known as The Club. So Edmund Burke, Samuel Johnson, and Oliver Goldsmith were all founding members. There were some others. The actor David Garrick was in there. The, the um, painter Sir Joshua Reynolds, who was the first president of the Royal Academy of Art in London. Um, so it was a group of sort of the, the um, most important um, artists and intellectuals of the period, the club. In a short span of years, from 1766 to 1773, Goldsmith uh, does something that's actually pretty remarkable for, for any writer. He publishes a novel, The Vicar of Wakefield, in 1766. He publishes his long poem, The Deserted Village, which we're reading in 1770. And he publishes a pair of plays, including um, his very famous uh, comedy, She Stoops to Conquer. That play is still quite popular today in 1773. And all of these works were enormously popular and much admired for and would be for over a century. And this gives Goldsmith the, the rare accomplishment of successful authorship in three major literary genres. Uh, so even though um, Goldsmith did not was not particularly prolific in any of these genres. Um, the fact that he wrote something in all three, a novel, a poem, and some plays that um, immortalized him is a pretty remarkable fact. And this was noted by Samuel Johnson himself when he wrote Goldsmith's epitaph when he died in 1774. Um, Samuel Johnson wrote, he touched almost every kind of writing and touched none that he did not adorn. We're reading The Deserted Village, which appeared in 1770. Some illustration from the beginning of the poem that shows some rustic people having a, having a good time. In its combination of rustic scenery and pastimes with expressions of deep loss, The Deserted Village is an example of what is called pastoral elegy, and we'll talk more about elegy when we, when we read Thomas Gray next. Um, but but expressions of deep loss in 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 a rustic setting um, so grief and loss um, in this context uh, the context of pastoral so goldsmith's evocation of uh, childhood memories and personal feelings in this poem 
is indicative of a trend in late 18th century poetry, and it's a trend that we will see continued um, with with um, uh, the poem, uh, the poets Thomas Gray and William Cooper, uh, which we'll be reading next. But it's a trend uh, towards affective modes of lyrical expression, uh, expressions of feeling, personal feeling, the evocation of sensibility, the ability to um, to, to, to be responsive to the feelings of others. And this would distinguish the poetry of the late 18th century and, um, and later the, the Romantic movement, which we will not be covering in this course that will be, that will be covered in British literature too. But in this poem, The Deserted Village, Goldsmith returns to a fictional village, the, the, the village of Auburn, uh, which he calls the loveliest village of the plain where health and plenty cheered the laboring swain. Um, and this evokes, when he returns to this village after being absent for many years, it evokes memories of a thriving, happy community. He, 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 re, he, re, he recalls singing and dancing and games, all of this unfolding under the stewardship of the village curate uh, and schoolmaster, whom he describes in the poem. And of course, uh, it doesn't take long for us to realize that that all of this is gone. Um, that 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 the village um, that he remembers when he returns after many years no longer exists. It has been abandoned, or nearly abandoned. So, what brought about this change, according to Goldsmith, was a series of laws that were passed. Uh, throughout the 18th century, and collectively they're known as the Enclosure Acts. And what these acts did essentially was parcel out what, what were called common lands that had for centuries been used by the British peasantry for grazing their livestock, harvesting uh, firewood, gardening, among other things. Um, but there were changes driving this. Um, England had a growing population that needed to be fed. There were advancements in agricultural technology. And so wealthy landowners were encouraged by the government to seek out more cultivable land, to expand their farming operations. And the obvious result of this is that a lot of, this, a lot of these common lands were disappearing. They were being absorbed into these larger agricultural estates. With the obvious result, that a large number of poor manorial tenants were paid, and sometimes they were compelled to surrender their holdings to get off the land. And they were forced either to relocate to the cities, um, which were becoming industrialized in the mid to late 18th century, or to emigrate to America. And Goldsmith actually presents both these options in the deserted village. Actually talks about um, the villagers emigrating to Georgia. And not a very flattering portrayal of Georgia in the poem. Goldsmith sees this consolidation of land and power as the mechanism of luxury and greed, which he explicitly contrasts in the poem with the idealized natural life of this disappearing, humble yeoman class of you know modest, rustic, people and their their simple lifestyle gone extinct and replaced uh, displaced by uh, the motives of luxury and greed so some of the things to look for as you're reading this poem is where do you see allusions to the enclosure acts in the deserted village where do you see evidence of the speaker's sensibility um, the poet's um, ability to feel, and wh where does the poet talk about his feelings? Who else in the poem evinces this quality of sensibility, the, the, the capacity to, to feel for others? Sensibility is, is nearly synonymous with the word we use today more commonly, uh, empathy. What role do women play in shaping the message of the poem. And what does Goldsmith envision as the role of the poet or the function of poetry? So look for all these things as you're reading, and then some of this will be the basis for comparing the deserted village with uh, 
uh, the poem that we're reading by George Crabbe called The Village. And Crabbe was very much aware of what Goldsmith had written when he wrote The Village. I don't have any younger portraits of George Crabbe. This, this is the older George Crabbe. This is not the 18th century George Crabbe. In 1754, he was born and raised in Attleboro, a poor fishing village in Suffolk on the on the, the east coast of, of England. In 1768, uh, he begins a medical apprenticeship that continues until 1775. He meets his future wife, Sarah Elmy, at this time, and also publishes some of his first poems. And, and, and unlike Auburn, which is a fictional village in Oliver Goldsmith's poem, Adelberg, is uh, in Suffolk is a um, an actual an actual village uh, where he was where he was raised and his portrayal of the people there is um, not particularly flattering to them. In 1777, he attempts to start his own medical practice in London, but is forced back to Edinburgh. He's it's not successful. He can't make a living there, and he returns to Edinburgh, but um, fares no better there. In 1780-81, he, he moves back to London to pursue a career as a poet, and he gains the patronage of Edmund Burke, um, who also was a close friend of Oliver Goldsmith. Um, much, you know, Gold, Goldsmith and Burke had met much earlier. This is now we're in, we're in, we're in the 1780s. We're not in the, um, the, the 1760s anymore. Um, he shows some of his poems to Edmund Burke, and Edmund Burke uh, sees, recognizes his ability um, and encourages him and helps him to get published. Um, and one of the things that he showed to Burke was an early draft of The Village. And Burke introduced him to Samuel Johnson and the painter Sir Joshua Reynolds. They became friends. In 1781, with Burke's support, he becomes an Anglican minister back in Adelberg. But eventually, he doesn't like it there. He really doesn't like the people. Uh, and eventually, he accepts a point, an appointment as chaplain to the Duke of Rutland at, Bel at Belvoir Castle, which you see pictured there on the left. Um, and this provides him, his relationship with the Duke of Rutland and later his widow provides him the financial security that he needs uh, to marry and continue writing poetry. And in fact, um, he continues um, um, remains very close to this aristocratic family for much the rest of his life. And they help him get curacies that will support him. In 1783, he publishes the poem that we're reading today, uh, The Village. It was, it was in two books, and we're reading the first book of the poem. In 1796, um, his son Edmund dies at the age of six. This was a particularly traumatic experience for the family and his wife Mary, um, uh, I'm sorry, Sarah is her name, begins a mental decline that forces him to devote much of his time to her care until her death in 1813. In 1807, he publishes his first book in over 20 years, uh, The Village of 1783. We're now in the 19th century, 1807. And this book contains uh, old and new poems, uh, including The Parish Register, which was quite popular, and begins um, uh, uh, a trend in Crabbe's poetry of writing uh, narrative poems about... Um, um, about about the poor, about the mentally ill, um, which was which was novel at the time. In 1809, he begins a friendship with the poet and novelist Sir Walter Scott. Sir Walter Scott is the major literary uh, figure in the in the in the world of novel writing in the early 19th century. Pioneers the um, the rise of what's called historical fiction, the blend of, of history and fiction, this series of novels called the Waverly Novels. Not important here. In 1810, 
um, he begins publishing very popular collections of narrative poems, which I mentioned before. One of them is called The Burrow in 1810, and another one called it Tales in 1812, and Tales from the Hall in 1819. We're not reading any of this material. It really belongs to uh, a later period, but it is part of Crabbe's career. In 1832, he dies after a brief illness in the same year as his close friend, Sir Walter Scott. So let's talk a little bit about The Village, which appeared in 1783. It's the only noteworthy poem that Crabbe wrote and published in the 18th century. Um, his reputation really rested rests on the poems that he published um, in the 19th century, The Burrow, um, uh, Tales, Tales from the Hall, uh, these, these collections of narrative poems. He agreed in principle with, with uh, Goldsmith's indignation at the luxuriousness and corruption that exploited the rural poor and displaced them from their land. But he also felt that Goldsmith had grossly misrepresented his subject matter, that he had relied too much on the conventions of pastoral poetry inherited from Virgil and Augustan poets like Pope and Matthew Pryor. And even though he, even though um, uh, Crabb writes in heroic couplets, uh, like Goldsmith and like Pope um, and Pryor, he professes to paint a more realistic picture of rustic life. Uh, true, uh, a picture that's true to the physical hardships and moral failings of people who live in abject poverty. So, um, one, if, if you were to describe the difference between the village and um, um, the Deserted Village by Goldsmith, I'd say one word pretty much does it, and that word would be realism. More realistic picture of rustic life. So some questions that can get us thinking about that is, what is Crabbe's view of pastoral poetry? What does he think about it? What does he say about Virgil and pastoral poetry in the village? Does poetry have the same power for Crabbe as it does for Goldsmith? How is Crabbe's view of nature different from Goldsmith's? You might be able to hear the train coming through. What is different about, Gold's, about Crabbe's treatment of rustic life? Um, what's it like to live in the country? And what is different about his portrayal of women and family life? in the village. So here are some ideas for you to think about as you're reading these two poems, and we'll talk about them uh, together in class. And that concludes this video presentation on Oliver Goldsmith and George Crabb.